the year is 1994 and Outkast would drop their debut album. The album received praise with the Source magazine being an example, giving Southern playlistic Cadillac music four and a half mics out of five, giving it between a slam and definite satisfaction and hip hop classic rating. A year later, Outkast would appear at the 1995 Source Awards and Andre would make a statement upon winning the best new rap group award. He would say that the South where Outkast was from has something to say. It ended up being a huge moment in rap and hip hop history and if people were sleeping on their debut album they would end up being wide awake when in 1996 Outkast would drop their sophomore album AT Aliens. But before I get more into the video I would first like to thank you guys for coming to see this. If you guys like the content you guys should like, comment, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Also follow my Instagram too that would be greatly appreciated. You guys can always reach out and just show me some love. It's all good. Let me know where you're tuning in from, represent where you're from, especially if you're representing ATL. Most importantly, comment down below what it was like for you when these albums first came out. But without further ado, let's get into the video. Before we get into AT Aliens, we have to touch on Southern Playalistic Cadillac music. While receiving decent commercial success with the album peaking at number 20 on the Billboard 200 charts, the album managed to receive really good reviews as I mentioned earlier. I mentioned The Source because this was back when The Source was the magazine and to some people was like a hip hop bible and their mic system led to some people purchasing an album or not. Nowadays things are much different in the landscape of rap and hip hop with many things but at this time the south wasn't looked at in the best light the east coast was start the culture but by this time in the early to mid 90s we started to see the emergence of the west coast the south was looked down upon during this time period people thought that people from the south were slow country they didn't like how they talked etc it was a bunch of different things that people thought back then and this is what led to andre at the 1995 awards saying that he was tired of closed-minded folks it's like they have a demo tape and nobody wanted to hear it in the south has something to say upon doing my research for this video I came across a video clip from funk master flex explaining why he didn't play the song elevators by outcast on the radio flex at this point was DJing for hot 97 based in New York which at this time was huge radio was a big deal and flex explains that he wasn't playing outcast because he didn't understand their delivery and looked upon a tribe called quest to fill that void for the feel of their music and the look the reason why i bring this up is that in the comments of this video people call cap on this and say that flex is trying to dodge around why he didn't really play outcast it was more than simply in his words not understanding their delivery and looking upon a group from new york to fill that void i'm all for taking a man at his word but deep down we all really know why he didn't and others didn't it's really sad to see it used to be this way but nonetheless outcast in the south broke through to a point where people had no other option but to acknowledge them now while outcast debut album received good reviews there were some people who didn't get the group style and with the group sophomore album we would see a huge shift in their music and personal lives keep in mind during the release of southern playlistic cadillac music both Andre and Big Boy were 18 about to turn 19. The two were young and rowdy. Drinking, girls, smoking, and partying were some of the things the group was indulging in around this time. Somewhere during this time period, Big Boy would meet his now ex-wife and they would have their first kid together in 1995. It made him more responsible because his daughter became his number one priority. He learned how to balance recording and being a father. Something else that would affect him unfortunately would be the passing of his aunt Renee. She helped raise him and he was extremely close to her. She would sadly pass away and he further speaks about his aunt Renee in the song Babylon on AT Aliens. Now when talking about the making of AT Aliens there's always been mention of this trip to Jamaica that the dungeon family of which Outkast was a part of went on. It's said that this trip would transform Outkast and they would recreate their whole image. Now, while the Dungeon family did go to Jamaica, Big Boy would end up not going on that trip. 
This is something that nobody really mentions and people say that Andre and Big Boy both went, which is false. The reason why Big Boy didn't go is that he was still grieving from his Aunt Renee's passing. He said this in an interview with Spin. I didn't make that trip. Everyone else in the Dungeon family went. Unfortunately, my Aunt Renee, who was my guardian at that time, passed away, so I missed that trip. I spoke about that on the song Babylon on AT Aliens. They all went to Jamaica and everybody came back with dreads and it was like, shoot. But I was grieving at the time, so I morphed into something else. As for Andre, he will go through a complete transformation during the making of the album. Andre's mother has said that he felt like he needed to change his life and a lot of things that he was doing he didn't want to do them anymore he stopped drinking went vegan grew out his hair got into books and spiritualism he even went back and got his ged in interviews andre has talked about how he didn't like how he looked in the mirror and saw himself deteriorate after the drugs or taking in every woman and being on the road he reached a point where he knew that he had to stop and this led to his lifestyle change it should also be noted that during the making of this album andre was be going through a breakup with Keisha who was in the R&B group Total. Their relationship is something that neither has really gone into immense detail about but Andre would be deeply affected by their breakup so much that he would go celibate for months. CeeLo Green who's a member of the Dungeon family said that Andre would be celibate for about a year. This transformation for Andre after Outkast's first album was definitely looked at with a side eye because he went from wearing jeans and a t-shirt with fresh sneakers on to turbans and dashikis. There was a lot of speculation on what was going on with Andre at this time with people thinking that he was crazy or on drugs. Comment down below what you thought in your mind when you started to see a change in Andre around this time. Now there's a very common misconception that Erica Badu was the one who transformed him. Organized Noise who produced Outkast's first album and has worked with them throughout the years denies this and has said that he was dressing differently before Erica Badu. He was wearing different colors that didn't match. They also said that the perception of the group shifted because on their first album, they were players and pimps, but with AT Aliens, people thought that they were space genies, like... <laughs> That's crazy, but by the time it got to Equimini, people just thought that they were just flat out weird, like... <laughs> Yo, I ain't gonna lie, that's kind of funny. But how Erica and Andre even met was at a club in New York and they immediately were attracted to each other. They ended up having a lot of things in common and created a bond that lasts to this day even though they aren't together anymore. Friends of Andre have described Erica as different, intelligent, and daring, which are the aspects that started to come out within Andre as we would see throughout the years. When Andre began to change, him and Big Boy became polar opposites and weren't spending much time together. They were getting older and into different things. Things got to a point where they had two separate tour buses with one being a non-smoking bus and the other being a smoking bus. You can tell who was on which bus. Big Boy at first couldn't believe Andre wasn't smoking anymore and they began growing separate ways. From the outside, people were wondering how was this going to work for the group moving forward. We know that at this time, the two managed to come together and deliver more music for some years. So far in this video, I've referenced the Dungeon and the Dungeon family a couple of times and wanted to further explain what those two things are because they're very vital to the backstory of Outkast. The Dungeon is Rico Wade's grandma's basement. Rico Wade is one third of the production trio of Organized Noise. The Dungeon is where Big Boy and Andre would spend countless hours writing songs and producing beats that became Outkast early albums. The Dungeon family is a music collective. There are a lot of different people in or affiliated with the Dungeon family spanning different generations, but some of the more notable names are Outkast, Organized Noise, and Goody Mob. Both the Dungeon and the Dungeon family would be a part of Outkast's career. Organized Noise were the ones who brought Outkast in and molded them according to Big Boy. How the process for the record of AT Aliens came about is that while on tour, Organized Noise went out the top floor of the Biltmore Hotel in Atlanta. They were camped out there with all kinds of beat machines and by the time the duo came home, they had already started laying the foundations of what went on to beat AT Aliens. By this time, they also had already started producing songs like Elevators. The duo learned from being 
happening under organized noise for so long. On AT Aliens, Big Boy and Andre ended up producing five songs together that ended up on the album. Andre and Big Boy ended up getting their equipment at the same time. When they did their publishing deal, that was the first time the two got some real money and they ended up investing in themselves. They wanted equipment, they wanted to make beats, and they set up their home studios and their apartments and Andre's dad's house. Besides the changes in appearance and lifestyle, as mentioned earlier with AT Aliens, we as fans started to hear a shift in the lyrics and production of the group. MTV would describe AT Aliens as built giddy with chaotic hooks around throbbing bass grooves, neck snapping drums, and bits of backwoods country and psychedelic rock for good measure. Whether you agree with this is up to you and with this album, the group would incorporate bits of gospel. According to Andre, it's because people in the south tend to stick closer to their slave roots with things such as spirituals, the church, and the struggle. It should also be noted that they didn't listen to rap and also didn't really like sampling because according to Big Boy, he felt like you cheat the listener when you sample leave the old to the old and he wanted his generation to have their own school of music another thing outcast will have to deal with during the making of this album is them being put on the back burner by their label LaFace records at this time according to andre focused on one record at a time and Tony Braxton was their focus at the time. She would go on to release her sophomore album, Secrets in June of 1996. Due to this though, Andre thought that he could speed up the process to get Outkast's own second album out. He decided to give an Atlanta radio station, WHTA Atlanta, in advance of what went on to be AT Aliens' first single, Elevators, Me and You. This was done in May of 1996 around the at the time annual Freak Nick celebration. It should also be noted that in the summer of that year, Atlanta would host the 1996 Summer Olympics, so this was definitely a big time in Atlanta. But back to May before the Olympics, and Andre would leak the first single for AT Aliens. Andre would give the record to DJ Jelly, and upon being interviewed about this, DJ Jelly would say that there was no way he wouldn't jump on it because Outkast at this time hadn't put out anything in a few years, and they were local artists. Due to the unplanned early release of Elevator, there was some tension with LaFace Records with local Atlanta radio DJs claiming that LaFace executives personally confiscated the pre-release single. Things weren't all bad though because L.A. Reid was the president and CEO of LaFace Records. He felt like Andre's act of self-promotion actually solidified LaFace's ties with local radio stations. After Elevators, L.A. Reid would let Outkast pick their singles for their albums because initially the label wasn't filling this song Elevators. They thought the duo was crazy for wanting that song to be the single. This combined with the label putting them on the back burner led to them leaking the record. In July of 1996, the lead single for AT Aliens, Me and You, was released officially. The song would peak at number 12 on the Billboard Hot 100 and would be their highest charting single to that date and would be their highest charting single until their song Miss Jackson in 2000. Elevators was also significant because the song would be produced under Earth Tone 3, which was a production trio of the members of Outkast and Mr. DJ who was in the Dungeon family. Mr. DJ initially was the DJ for Outkast during their first album, but during the making of AT Aliens, he would start a production company with Outkast and they would call it Earth Tone 3. Mr. DJ credits Elevators to Andre though and said that he pretty much did all of it. Elevators was sparked the first time the Earth Tone 3 recorded themselves, produced themselves, and would be the start of them producing the rest of Outkast albums. The second single for AT Aliens would be the self-titled song named after the album, and it would peak at number 35 on the Billboard Hot 100. The ATL capitalized in AT Aliens represents Atlanta, while the alien part represents Outkast status as foreigners in the rap game. Further about alienation, Andre would say, being an alien is just being yourself when people don't understand you. We just trying to let everybody know there's a place for everybody in this world. You just gotta find yourself and be true to yourself. That's how you get prosperous and happy. The title of the album was also fueled by Outkast's belief that somebody or something had to be out there in the universe other than just us. When Andre talked about IFOs landing indicator, he knew that some people had already seen that type of stuff. 
IFO stand for Identified Flying Objects. As time went by, the fans of the group would see how their thoughts of space and things like aliens affected their work. During the making of the album, it's been said that the duo recorded around 35 songs for the album that ended up getting narrowed down to 15 if we're counting the ONB 86 mix of Elevators. That would mean that 20 songs would not be included on the album, but Big Boy would say that a lot of these songs trickled down into other records. He would further say that some songs that didn't make Southern play a list that kind of like music ended up on AT Aliens and some songs that didn't make it on AT Aliens ended up on Equimini. The cycle continued from there. He notes that the song West Savannah from Equimini was initially supposed to be on their first album. The hype for Outkast software album though was very high and we would see the album release in August of 1996 peaking at number two on the Billboard 200 charts selling nearly 355,000 copies in its first two weeks of release. A cool thing that also came with the album was a 24 page comic book. The album's cover art is something that really pops out at you and it's something that people People distinctly remember. D.L. Warfield, at the time of the making of AT Aliens, was the creative director at LaFace Records. In interviews, he said that the album AT Aliens doesn't sound like an album and instead sounded like a movie. He further said that comic books are basically like paper movies, so he suggested the cover for the album to represent a comic book. Nigel Sawyer, who was the co-art director at LaFace Records at the time, said that the idea for a comic book cover was actually the idea of him and Vince Robinson. They both read comic books and loved the bold artwork of Todd McFarlane. Outkast and their team sent out some Outkast photos and sketches to McFarlane, but he turned them down. Still determined to get this done, they passed the opportunity along to a man by the name of Frank Gomez. Frank Gomez has done work for both DC and Marvel, and he would turn in a draft of the artwork for AT Aliens with the character that was supposed to be Big Boy, but didn't look anything like him. This resulted in the idea of covering Big Boy's face a little bit with the hat, and the problem was solved. But AT Aliens is a phenomenal album with cuts that I haven't mentioned yet, like Two Dope Boys in a Cadillac, Jazzy Bell, Wheels of Steel, Babylon, and 13th Floor, Growing Old to name a few. After their first album and the tours that followed, Outkast began to realize the power of their words and music, and that fueled the creativity behind AT Aliens, which is regarded as one of the best rap albums of all time. After the AT Aliens era, we get into the Equimini era and by 1997, both Andre and Big Boy would be fathers with Big Boy having another kid by the time Equimini came out. Outkast's first two albums would be platinum by this time as well. The release of AT Aliens would prove that Outkast was here to stay and wasn't a flash in the pan. The recording process for Equimini would be different from their other albums due to their commercial success, higher budgets, and having a more relaxed schedule. Outkast and the people working on the album would live and work in the studio for for a week straight creating Equimini. Their first three albums would follow a pattern of releasing within two years of each other. Big Boy has said that the reason why this is so is because they take their time because they didn't want to give their fans fast food music trying to meet a deadline. The music wasn't done to them until it was done sonically. While making Equimini, the group used things like improv and live instrumentation to mold the sound. This led to around 40 artists contributing to vocals or instrumentation. There are also around 21 other different credits that went to mixers, engineers, arrangers, producers, and composers. Mule H. Pogue, Yo, if I said that name wrong, I'm sorry. But Neil H. Pogue, who's a sound mixer and recording engineer, said that the beauty of the making of Equimini and having musicians come in and out of the studio reminded him of Motown Records or Stax Records from back in the day due to the organic feel that it gave off. It brought back that whole feeling of making records. With Equimini, we will see Outkast step it up with their own production again, with Ertone 3 having production credits on over half of the album. Everything wasn't peaches and cream though when it came to the album because there were some budding opinions on how the album should start. Big Boy wanted the album to start off with Y'all Scared, while Kawan Prather, who's a former LaFace Records A&R and early 
Only Dungeon Family member wanted the song Return of the Gangsta to start off the album. This ended up leading to a falling out between Kawan and Big Boy for a couple of months. Big Boy had missed his flight coming to the mastering session of the album and by the time he got there, the people working on the album already had gone through what they thought was a good flow for the album. Kawan's thought was that the album couldn't start off with a bunch of other people on it. Big Boy would reply to this and tell Kawan that Kawan didn't rap, so why didn't he just rap if he had such an opinion? People had to get kicked out of the studio so they could have a real conversation with one another. A conversation not based on ego, but based on what they wanted to be dope about the album due to them being both passionate people and having a common goal. Ultimately, Equimini would be a very experimental album for the group and a lot of the time during the making of this album was spent on production. A very interesting part that not a lot of people know about the backstory of Equimini is that the group originally planned to create a film in conjunction with Equimini. Outkast was excited about making a movie but had no idea what it took to actually make one with Big Boy noting that it takes over two years to put one out and they had a script three months months before Aquamanai came out. They would have a meeting with MTV who ended up loving the film idea for Aquamanai. However, MTV wanted to buy the project and instead cast Missy Elliott and Busta Rhymes instead of Outkast due to them having more star power according to MTV. Granted, this is pre Stankonia and The Love Below and Andre said that he understood him and Big Boy weren't big enough at the time. Things wouldn't be all bad though because video director Brian Barber was supposed to direct the Aquemini movie but years later he would direct Outkast Idlewild movie that released in 2006 in conjunction with Outkast's last studio album to this date of the same name. So this idea of doing a movie in conjunction with an album ended up working out in the end. The first single for the album would be School on the Barbie featuring Raekwon from the Wu-Tang Clan. About the song, Raekwon would say, That right there really opened up the door for the South to come in hard body if you ask me. Like when we made that record, I can literally say nobody was listening to the South up in New York. Up in the East Coast, period. When we did that record and they was playing it on the radio, everybody loved the combination factor that was there and me why i done the record anyway from the door was because i get a lot of love from the south too wu-tang gets a lot of love in the south so for me to be fans of these cats and they kind of got their own style i kind of like appreciated them a lot how the track came about is raekwon was in atlanta because he had a place in buckhead and he met big boy in lennox square mall he thought of him as cool and a genuine dude and they both were fans of each other's work they both entertained the idea of working together and two or three days later, Raekwon ended up in the dungeon and they started running through beats. Raekwon has described this as a coincidence record because Outkast wasn't banking on the record to win over New York and the East Coast. But just like it did wonders for Outkast in New York, it also blew up Raekwon even more in the South. The track was also significant because Raekwon was the first non-Dungeon family member to feature on an Outkast album. His verse on the song has been praised as one of the best guest verses of all time. The song School on the Barbie ultimately would fail to chart on the Billboard Hot 100. This didn't really affect anything because Equimini would be released in September of 1998 peaking at number 2 on the Billboard 200, selling 227,000 copies in its first week of release. The name Equimini came from Big Boy being an Aquarius and Andre being a Gemini. You put that together and you get Equimini, which is a recurring theme throughout the album, showcasing the different personalities of two people. With this album, we would see further evolution with Big Boy and Andre, but mainly with Andre, especially with his fashion sense. He dressed even more eccentric as some people have described. Described. You can look at the school on the Barbie video where Andre was wearing a blonde wig, furry pants and boots. In the Rosa Parks video, he was wearing tiger stripe pants, football shoulder pads, and umpire gear from baseball. In the Art of Storytelling video, he has a purple tux, knee-high socks, 
black mixed with purple shorts and a star on his chest, he was getting even more flack for how he was dressing at this point. He addressed this in the song Return of the G on the album at the end of his verse. A fan favorite off of this album is the self-titled song named after the album Equimini. Here's what Andre had to say about the song. I was a young man searching, a young black man, so I was looking into Rastafarianism, Islam, whatever. I started to notice that all the stories were similar. It was more about a mutual respect and exchange of energy. When you rap and say anything kind of conscious, all the conscious people approach you. So after AT Aliens, I got it all, from books on sex to metaphysics and religion. But you also get introduced to a lot of fake phony people and I addressed it in the song. You find some of the fakest people with dreads pouring oils on you. And it's really kind of mind blowing when you're a young person and you start to find out some of this BS so then you're just out there searching. Big Boy describes Equimini as the meshing of both worlds. Things were subtle on AT Aliens but by the time they got to Equimini it was like him and Andre had two different visions that were parallel. The last verse from Andre on the song is regarded as one of the best verses of all time and rightfully so. Rosa Parks ended up being the second single for the album and it ended up peaking at number 55 on the Billboard Hot 100. Andre has said that he actually initially submitted the beat for Rosa Parks for the R&B group Total first when he was with Keisha, but they said that they couldn't use it, which led to Outkast then using it for Rosa Parks. Big Boy was the guy who created a lot of hooks for the group, and the hook for Rosa Parks is one that he came up with. Naming the song Rosa Parks was supposed to be metaphorical, but this song would land Outkast in some trouble. I really wanted to end the video with the release of Equimini and not really get into the events that happened afterward, but there would end up being a lawsuit over the song. The lawsuit filed in 1999 alleged defamation and trademark infringement because Outkast used Rosa Parks' name without her permission in the song titled Rosa Parks. According to Mr. DJ, the song was never meant to be derogatory and never crossed their minds until the lawsuit came. Their claim, according to Andre, was that they used her name to sell records. New Age Pogue, once again, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but they believed that Rosa Parks was being misled by her handlers. They just wanted her to get some money out of it. Outcast didn't mean any harm because it was more like a tribute, but her people felt like the song was slanderous. Andre would further say, I think that was a huge confusion and misunderstanding, but when you're working with someone of Rosa Parks standing, you've got to do your job. I understand it. But me and Big always said if something come across our lap, we're going to fight it. We've got enough money to do it. By 2002, Rosa Parks had dementia and her own family said dementia or not, she would never ever go to that length to hurt some young artist trying to make it in the world. Her family feared that during her last days, she was surrounded by strong strangers trying to make money off of her name. Years later in 2005, they ended up settling the lawsuit and Outkast would help develop educational programs to enlighten the youth about the significant role Rosa Parks played in making America a better place for all races. The Art of Storytelling Part 1 would be the final single for the album. The song would go on to be remixed by Slick Rick, who's regarded as one of the best storytellers in rap history. The song sees Big Boy and Andre telling two distinct stories, with Big Boy telling his experience with the promiscuous woman that he encountered and Andre telling a tragic tale about a girl from his past. About the song, Andre would say that every story that he's ever told is either triggered by something that he's been through or something that someone he knows has experienced. So that means a lot of the times that his stories are based on something real. When him and Erica Badu were still together, one of Erica's friends in Dallas had a young daughter who was really intelligent. She was in school one day and the teacher asked her what she wanted to be when she grew up. And the answer that she gave was alive. Andre always thought that that was cool, so he wove it into the story that he was telling. But Equimini has so many dope songs, with Spoda Ode Dope Delicious being another one. Around the making of this song, Andre was listening to a lot of reggae music, with him listening to a lot of Bob Marley. Andre was also inspired by the famous pimp Iceberg Slim, who used to put out albums talking over beats, and he thought that that was cool. Erica Badu was initially supposed to feature on the song, but she would end up on 
the song Liberation, which is a lot of people's favorite Outkast song. The last thing I want to mention about Equimini is that if you look at the people who featured on the album that weren't associated with the Dungeon family and not counting Raekwon, there's someone who sticks out and that person is George Clinton. He would feature on the song Synthesizer and George knew Outkast before they even released their first album. He worked with them throughout the years and has said that he has a ton of unreleased material with the group starting from 1995 up until 1999. He has done stuff with Big Boy, but that was years later. Of course, we know that Equimini would be the stepping stone to the two most popular Outkast albums, Stankonia, which was released in 2000, and Speaker Box, The Love Below, in 2003. I could have definitely made a video about the bridge between those two albums, but I felt like, at least for this video, it was more important to tell the story about the two albums that the group really crafted their style and is what fans regard as their best work. Let me know in the comments what other videos you would like to see the history behind with two albums. Outkast is one of my favorite groups of all time, so I had a blast making this video. All in all, let me know what you thought of the video. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.